I usually like to start a lecture with a, something new, but this time I'm going to make an exception and start with the finishing up of Friday because it involves a little more practice with complex numbers, and I think uh, that's what a large number of you is still fairly weak in. So to briefly remind you, it will be sort of self-contained, but still uh, it will use complex numbers, and I think is a good way to start today. <coughs> so. Remember, the basic problem was to solve something with a, a, where the input was sinusoidal in particular. The k was on both sides, and the input looked like cosine omega t. And the plan of the solution consisted of transporting the problem to the complex domain. So you look for a complex solution and you complexify the right-hand side of the equation as well. So cosine omega t becomes the real part of this complex function. The reason for doing that, remember, was because it's easier to handle when you solve linear equations. It's much easier to handle exponentials on the right-hand side than it is to handle sines and cosines because exponentials are so easy to integrate when you multiply them by other exponentials. So the result was, after doing that, y tilde turned out to be uh, <clears throat> 1, after I scaled the coefficient, 1 over 1 plus omega over k. And then the rest was e to the i uh, times uh, omega t minus phi. where phi had a certain meaning. It was the arctangent of a, it was a phase lag. And uh, this was then, I had to take the real part of this to get the final answer, uh, which came out to be something like 1 over the square root of 1 plus uh, the amplitude 1 omega k squared. And then the rest was cosine omega t plus minus phi. It's easy to see that that part is the real part of this. The problem is, of course, you have to convert this. Sorry, this should be I omega t, in which case you don't need the parentheses either. So the problem was to use the polar representation of this complex number to convert it into something whose amplitude was this and whose angle was minus, I, was minus phi. Now, that's what we call the polar method going polar. I'd like now, for the first uh, few minutes of the period, to talk about the other method, of Car the Cartesian method. I think for a long while, many of you will be more comfortable with that anyway, although one of the objects of the course should be to try to get you equally comfortable with the polar representation of complex numbers. So if we try to do the same thing going Cartesian, What's going to happen? Well, I get to the same point here. So the starting point is still y tilde equals 1 over, <coughs> sorry, this should have an i here, 1 plus i times omega over k, e to the i omega t. But now what you're going to do is, turn this into its Cartesian, turn both of these into their Cartesian representations as a plus ib. So if you do that Cartesianly, of course, what you have to do is the standard thing about dividing complex numbers or taking the reciprocals that I told you at the very beginning of complex numbers. You multiply the top and bottom by the complex conjugate of this in order to make the bottom real. So what does this become? This becomes 1 minus i times omega over k, divided by the product of this and its complex conjugate, which is the real number 1 plus omega over k squared. So I've now converted this to the a plus bi form. I have also to convert the right-hand side to the a plus bi form. So it will look like cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. Having done that, I take the last step, which is to take the real part of that, 
remember, the reason I want the real part is because this input was the real part of the complex input. So once you've got the complex solution, you have to take its real part to go back into the domain you started with the real numbers from the domain of complex numbers. So I want the real part is going to be The real part of that is, first of all, there's the factor out in front. Let's uh, put that, since that's entirely real, let's put it uh, out in front so it doesn't bother us particularly. And now, I need the, the product of this complex number and that complex number, but I only want the real part of it. So I'm not going to multiply it out and get four terms. I'm just going to look at the two terms that I do want. I don't want the others. All right, the real part is cosine omega t from the product of this and that. And the rest of the real part will be the product of the two i terms, but it's i times negative i, which makes 1. And therefore, it's omega over k times sine omega t. Now, that's the answer. And that's the answer to, uh, they must be equal if, unless there's a contradiction in mathematics. Uh, but it's extremely important, and that's the other reason why I'm giving you this, that you learn in this course to be able to convert quickly and automatically things that look like this into things that look like that. And that's done by means of a basic formula, which uh, is, occurs at the end of the notes for reference, as I optimistically say, although I, I think uh, for a lot of you it will not be reference, but you know, stuff that in the category of, yeah, I think I've vaguely seen that somewhere, but uh, well, we never used it for anything. OK, you're going to use it all term. So the formula is the famous trigonometric identity which is, so the problem is to convert this into the other guy. And the thing which is going to do that, enable one to combine the sine and the cosine terms, is the famous formula that A times the cosine, I'm going to use theta because, uh, to make it as neutral as possible. So theta you can think of as being replaced by omega t in this particular application of the formula. But I'll just use a general angle theta, which doesn't suggest anything in particular. So the problem is you have a, something which is a combination with real coefficients of cosine and sine. And the important thing is that these numbers be the same. In practice, that means that the omega t, you're not allowed to have omega 1, you're not allowed to have omega 1 t here and some other frequency, omega 2t here. That would correspond to using theta 1 here and theta 2 here. And though there is a formula for combining that, nobody remembers it. And it's, in general, less universally useful than the first. If you're going to memorize a formula and learn this one, uh, it's best to start with the ones where the two are equal. That's the basic formula. The others are variations of it, but uh, there's sizable variations. All right, so the answer is that this is equal to some other constant, real constant, times the cosine of omega ugh, theta. <laughs> theta minus phi. Of course, most people remember this vaguely. What they don't remember is what the c and the phi are how to calculate them. I don't suggest you memorize the f formulas for them, but you can if you wish. Instead, memorize the picture, which is much easier. Memorize that A and B are the two sides of a right triangle. Phi is the angle opposite the B side, and C is the length of the hypotenuse. OK, that's worth uh, putting up. Uh, I think that's a pink formula. It's even worth two of those, but I'll uh, thrift. Now, 
let's apply it to this case to see that it gives the right answer. All right. So to use this formula, how will I use it? Well, I should, uh, I should uh, take, I'll reproduce the left-hand side, so that part I just copy. And now how about the right? Well, the amplitude, it's a combined, cos it's the combined into a single cosine term whose amplitude is, well, the two sides of the right triangle are 1 and omega over k. The hypotenuse in that case is going to be, oh, well, why don't we write it here? So we have 1 and omega over k. And here's phi. So the hypotenuse is going to be the square root of 1 plus omega over k squared. And that's going to be multiplied by the cosine of omega t minus this phase lag angle, phi. You can write, if you wish, phi equals the arctangent of, uh, but it, you're not learning a lot by that. Phi is the arctangent of omega over k. That, that's uh, OK, but it's true. Uh, but notice there's cancellation now. This over that is equal to what? Well, it's equal to this. And what, so when we get in this way, by combining these two factors, one gets exactly the same formula that we got before. So as you can see, in some sense, there's not, if you can remember this trigonometric identity, uh, there's not a lot of difference between the two methods except that this one requires this extra step of you know, the answer will come out in this form, and uh, you then, to see what it really looks like, really have to convert it to this form, the form in which you can see what the phase lag and the amplitude is. It's amazing how many people who should know this includes working mathematicians, theoretical mathematicians, it includes even possibly the authors of your textbook. I'm not sure, but I've caught them in this too. Uh, who, you know, in this form, everybody remembers that it's something like that. Unfortunately, when it occurs as the answer in an answer book, you know, and this, the numbers are some colossal mess here plus some colossal mess here, and theta t is, uh, again, a, a real mess with involving roots and so, roots, cube roots and whatnot. The only thing is these two are the same real mess that uh, that amounts to just another pure oscillation with the same frequency as the old guy had and with the amplitude changed and its phase lag and its phase, phase with a phase shift moved to the right or left. So this is no more general than that. Notice they both have two parameters in them, these two coefficients. This one has the two parameters in an altered form. OK, well, um, I wanted, uh, because of the importance of this formula, I wanted to take a couple of minutes out to uh, proof of the formula. just to give you a chance to stare at a little more. Now, there are three proofs I know. I'm sure there are 27. Like, uh, the Pythagorean theorem now has several hundred. But uh, there are three basic proofs. There is the one I will not give you. I'll call the high school proof, which is the only one one normally finds in books, physics textbooks or other textbooks. Uh, the high school proofs takes the right-hand side, applies the formula for the cosine of the difference of two angles, which it assumes you had in trigonometry, uh, and then converts it into this. It shows you that the, uh, once you've done that, that A turns out to be C cosine phi, and B, the number B is C sine phi, and therefore it identifies the two sides. Now, the th wrong, th the thing that's that's, of course, correct, and it's the simplest possible argument. The thing that's no good about it is that the direction in which it goes is from here to here, 
Well, everybody knew that. If I gave you this and told you write it out in terms of cosine and sine, I would assume and dearly hope that practically all of you could do that. Unfortunately, when you want to use the formula, it's this way you want to use it, in the opposite direction. You're starting with this and want to convert it to that. Now, the proof, therefore, will not be of much help. It, re it requires you to go in the backwards direction and match up coefficients. It's much better to go forwards. Now, there are two proofs that go forwards. There is the 1802 proof. Since I didn't teach most of you 1802, I can't be sure you had it. So uh, I'll spend one minute giving it to you. What is the 1802 proof? It is the following picture. Picture. I think this requires deep colored chalk. <laughs> it's going to be pretty heavy. All right. Uh, first of all, the A and the B are the given, so I'm going to put in that vector. So there is the vector whose sides are, whose components are A and B. I'll write it without the I and J, and just in the, in this, I hope you had from Jarrison that form. Uh, for the vector. That, if you don't like that, write ai plus bj, OK? Uh, now, there's another vector lurking around. It's the vector, the unit vector, whose uh, I'll write it this way, u because it's a unit vector, and theta to indicate that its angle is theta. Now, the reason for doing that is because you see that the left-hand side is a dot product of two vectors. The left-hand side of the identity is the dot product of the vector AB with the vector whose components are cosine theta and sine theta. That's what I'm calling this unit vector. It's a unit vector because cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. Now, all this formula is is saying that the scalar product, the dot product of those two vectors, can be evaluated if you know their components by the left-hand side of the formula. And if you don't know their components, it can be evaluated in another way, the geometric evaluation, which goes, what is it? It's the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other times the cosine of the included angle. Now, what's the included angle? Well, theta is this angle from the horizontal to that unit vector. Uh, this is the, the angle phi is this angle from, that, from this picture here. And therefore, the included angle between u theta and my pink vector is theta minus phi. That's the formula. It comes from two ways of calculating the scalar product of the vector whose coefficients are a, b, and the unit vector whose components are sine theta, cosine theta and sine theta. All right, well, you should, uh, that was 1802. There must be an 1803 proof also. Yes. What's the 1803 proof? The 1803 proof uses complex numbers. It says, look, take the left side. Instead of viewing it as the dot product of two vectors, there's another way. You can think of it as the part of the product of two complex numbers. So the 1803 argument, the really the complex number argument, says, look, multiply together a minus bi and the complex number cosine theta plus i sine theta. There are different ways of explaining why I want to put the minus i there instead of i. But the simplest is because I, I want, when I take the real part, to get the left-hand side. I will. If I take the real part of this, I'm going to get a cosine theta plus b sine theta because of negative i and i make 1 multiplied together. All right. 
That's the left-hand side. <clears throat> and now the right-hand side, I'm going to use polar representation instead. What's the polar representation of this guy? Well, if AB has the angle theta, then A negative B, A minus BI goes down below. It has the angle minus P. So this is, has magnitude in its polar representation. Its magnitude is A squared plus B squared, and its angle is negative phi, not positive phi because of this. A minus BI goes below the axis if A and B are positive. So it's E to the minus I phi. That's the first guy. And how about the second guy? Well, the second guy is e to the i theta. So what's the product? It is a squared plus b squared, the square root, times e to the i times theta minus phi. And now, what do I want? The real part of this, and I want the real part of this. So let's just say, take the real parts of both sides. If I take the real part of the left-hand side, I get a cosine theta plus b sine theta. If I take the real part of this side, I get square root of a squared plus b squared times e times the cosine, that's the real part, right, of theta minus phi, which is just what it's supposed to be. Well, with three different arguments, I'm really pounding the table on this formula. But uh, I think there's something to be learned from at least two of them. And you know, I, I'm still, for a while, I'll never miss an opportunity to bang complex numbers into your head. Uh, you know, because in some sense, you have to reproduce the experience of the race. Uh, as I mentioned in the notes, it took mathematicians three or four hundred years to get used to complex numbers. So if it takes you three or four weeks, that's not too bad. Now, for the rest of the period, I'd like to talk, go back to the linear equations uh, and try to uh, put in perspective and summarize and tell you a couple of things which I had to le leave out, but which are, in my view, extremely important. And up to now, I don't want to leave you with any misapprehension. So I'm going to summarize this way. I'm going, in whereas the last lecture, I went from the most general equation to the most special. I'd like to do, just write them down in the reverse order now. So we're talking about the basic linear equations. First order, of course. We haven't moved into the second order yet. So the most special one, and the one we talked about essentially all uh, the previous two times, or the last Friday anyway, was the equation where the k is constant the coefficient of y is constant, and where you also get it on the right-hand side, uh, quite providentially. So this is the most special form, and it was the one which governed the, what I'll call the temperature concentration model, uh, or if you want to be grown up, the conduction diffusion model. Conduction diffusion, which describes the processes which the equation is multi uh, uh, modeling whereas these simply describe the variables, the things which you usually you're trying to calculate when you use the equation. Uh, now, there are a class of things where the thing is constant, but where the k does not appear naturally on the right-hand side. And you're going to count to them pretty quickly in physics for one place. Uh, so I better not try to sweep those under the rug. Let's just call that q of t. And finally, there is the most general case where you allow k to be non-constant. That's the one we began when we talked about the linear equation. Uh, and you know how to solve it in general by a, a, definite a definite or an indefinite integral. 
Now there's one other thing which I want to talk about. Uh, I'll do all these in a certain order. But from the beginning, you should keep in mind that, that there's another, between the first two cases, there's another extremely important distinction. And that is as to whether k 